folks, welcome back to Walters Aircraft Works. It's June 4th, 2018. Uh, hey, it's been quite some time since I posted a video. Been real busy doing lots of other stuff except for working on the EV, but we're about to get back to it. Took us a little time to figure out what to do about a battery pack, a little research, a little uh, shopping around. Uh, finally found one um, down in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I had to drive down and pick it up. I actually sent the wife down there to pick it up and it's back here in the shop we're gonna pry it open here and uh, take a look I won't go through the video of uh, or show you in the video of, of opening up the case there's plenty of uh, videos out there on the internet that show you opening these uh, Nissan Leaf battery pack so that's it yep it's a Nissan Leaf uh, comes out of a 2015 I believe or 2016 leaf uh, 24 kilovolt hour pack and uh, well let's take a look at it all right there it is uh, uh, 650 pounds worth sitting on uh, some furniture dollies there so I can move it around I have had the lid open or the case open on it like I said I'm not going to take you through that process there's plenty of videos out there on YouTube that'll show you how to crack these things open. I'll just show you what's inside and what I plan to do with it. I I actually plan on moving these videos along a little faster. I've taken some criticism over the pace of my videos. Say I talk too uh, too much and work too little and uh, my wife would probably agree with that. But uh, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. I you know like I said from the very first video this is a comprehensive conversion. There's plenty of stuff out there that gives you, give you bits and pieces, but I'm trying to do this in a comprehensive form. So there might be a little bit more talking than required. I don't know about required, but may bore people. But hey, isn't that what the uh, the fast forward button's for? But, uh, here we go. Um, let me get it opened up. We'll take a look and uh, talk about what we're going to do with the battery pack itself. All right, there it is, uh, all 650 pounds of, of uh, uh, electrical energy, I guess. I like this pack. I like these Nissan LEAF packs. Um, the modules, there's 48 of these individual modules in here. They're, they're stacked up and all stuck together. There's 48 of them, but they're rectangular shape, basically the size of a piece of paper that's about three quarters of an inch or an inch thick. I think it's gonna be easy to use these batteries, these modules to make um, battery compartments inside of our Mazda. So that's one of the reasons why I chose this pack. There's a lot of support on the internet for these packs with uh, BMS systems, um, you know, and chargers. A lot of people are using these packs to, to do these conversions or you know, power scooters and, and go-karts and all kinds of stuff. So I, I think it's gonna be a very do-it-yourself or home gamer battery uh, module. All right, so 48 individual modules uh, making up 360 volts, 24 kilovolt hour pack. We're going to need to break that down into something more manageable. Our motor and our speed controller won't handle 360 volts, so we're going to need to break this down separate these modules and then reconfigure them to be less than 96 volt and i'll show you how i'm planning on doing that so in an effort to move these videos along and the fact that there's other videos out there that show you how to break these packs down i won't take you through that painstaking process i'll just do it and then bring you back in once i get the modules out needless to say safety uh, there are a lot of energy in this pack. Um, I don't need to say it. I mean, you guys should know it. There's a lot of energy in this pack. I'm going to take my ring off. I'll take my watch off. I may even put some rubber gloves on. But I'm going to use caution taking this pack apart. Try to break it down. Get the uh, the modules isolated. You know, one, one module at a time. It's not a lot of energy. But the pack in its sum um, has got a lot of energy in it. So I'm going to use a lot of caution. Hey, there's one other thing that I wanted to make mention of here and another reason why I chose this Nissan Leaf pack. This is an air-cooled pack. There's no uh, there's no coolant system like the, uh, the Tesla and the uh, Volt have. It makes these modules uh, very square. I mentioned it earlier about the size of a, a 
you know, a one inch thick ream of paper. But what I wanted to mention here was look how closely they are, they're stacked together. There's no real air gap between these modules. They didn't put any spacers between them. It appears like there's a little bit of a gap, but if you get up real close, they're, they're really just um, relying on the aluminum covering itself to dissipate the heat. So if Nissan can do it, put it in this enclosed container with no fans and no liquid coolant, then we can do it as well. I think the key to that is, uh, you know, how fast you put the energy in and how fast you take the energy out. And for what I'm planning on doing with my little car, uh, we're not going to be racing it. My wife's going to be driving it back and forth to work. I don't think the energy is going to be coming out that fast. So uh, another reason why I like this pack, there's no uh, worries with coolant. I'm planning on sticking it together just like Nissan did. Um, button them right up next to each other, bolting them together, and putting them in a uh, sealed container for uh, for safety. As we uh, we dig into this thing, I think there's lessons to be learned from the way that Nissan did it. And uh, if you notice the cover over here, there was two of these covers. I got the other one over on the bench, and I'll show you here in a minute. But there's wiring going into those plastic covers, so they're more than just insulating value. There's a sensor in there. So uh, I pulled that off and brought it over to the bench. Let's take a look at it. All right, over here at the bench, we have the cover hooked into the connector here, just shoved into the back of the connector. I've got my pins or my uh, contact uh, probes for my Fluke 88, and I've got it set in, in uh, ohm mode. And you can see it's reading a resistance uh, 8.33. And if we, if we warm this plate, uh, there's an aluminum plate on the back side of it, and then attached to the top side of this aluminum plate you can see is that's a well it's a resistor and it's measuring it, it's changing the resistance with with temperature so if I it's sensitive enough for if I just put my hand on the back side of it you can see the resistance increase pretty quickly so what what can we understand from uh, from this little experiment well, it looks like they're monitoring the temperature of that section of modules. And let me swing you back around and we'll talk about that some more. All right, so here we are back around looking at the pack. Uh, here's the cover I had moved, removed previously. And I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is they're only measuring the temperature of parts of this pack, not individual modules, and definitely not individual cells. You can see there's another one of these uh, temperature monitors right here on this section of the pack, and I'm assuming, uh, we'll trace it down, but I'm assuming there's one for each one of these individual stacks here. Nissan didn't feel the need to monitor every cell or every individual module is what I'm gathering from, um, from what I'm seeing here. Maybe as we get into it, we'll find more temperature monitoring systems or you know, ways to monitor each individual cell or each individual module. All right, we're finding a little bit more of this thermal protection. Um, this piece came out from the end of the battery pack here, or the stack of these uh, modules here. Again, uh, just kind of spot protection doesn't look like individual protection for uh, for thermal um, just another one of these pads here and of course uh, the stack right next to it is arranged the same way all right with uh, with a little more poking around under here i think i've kind of figured out the way that this temperature sensing system works we've been talking or looking at those temperature pads uh, the center stack uh, pads are let me spin you here a little bit are uh, located right here um, on both sides and they're all kind of daisy chained together so the the pads for the the big stack are on top the ones in the center on the end we saw earlier were the ones on the uh, the end stacks were and they're all kind of daisy chained together to this box right here i pulled the cover off the top of it to kind of take a peek inside and there's a couple of relays here and then a brain box. But what I think the deal is, the wiring for the, this harness that daisy chains all these temperature pads together, 
it's probably got a um, there's only two wires going into the connector so they can't be they have to be series wired so it takes a sum of the resistance at a cool temperature and then as the pack warms up the resistance value of those pads increase and it it continues to increase and if it goes past a predetermined threshold that is stored inside this brain box right here uh, you know if, if a section of the of the battery pack is overheating then it's going to raise that value past that threshold and those relays will break and it'll stop charging the whole pack is the way I, I think it is um, not a very sophisticated system it's not capable it doesn't appear at this point at least from a temperature standpoint that the system is capable of isolating a single module and stop the charging to that module now this has, that's just temperature related um, the BMS that's mounted right over here it, I think is looking at individual voltage for each individual module and we'll look at that here in a little bit but as far as temperature is concerned and whether there's a thermal runaway um, it's not a real sophisticated system here's another little interesting thing that I, I haven't quite figured out yet but this little probe right here that I've pulled out was pushed into the bottom, just clipped into the bottom of that module. And it looks to me like another temperature sensor. There's only three of them stuck in the whole pack. One there, you can see, just barely see one right there. And there's one on the back side, that wire loom goes around the back side of this long pack. And it's stuck right in the middle, about where that module is right there. And then the loom continues around to the back side um, or to the front side of the BMS. The BMS is on the other side of this long pack. And you can see the connector right there. I've disconnected it from the BMS. So it again looks like some type of temperature sensing. I'll uh, run the same test on it, hook my ohm meter up to it and uh, see if I can get some kind of resistance change um, with heat but it's weird that it's only three three places here here and on the back side of this long um, module or long stack of modules there's nothing over on this side of the pack strange yeah this this is turning out to be kind of interesting here's two of the probes removed I've got the meter hooked up to the harness and these are not hooked in series they're hooked in parallel so the BMS can monitor those three spots in the pack why just three spots I don't know but it can monitor three spots in that pack for temperature and you can tell that by I've got the meter hooked up to this the wires for this particular probe and the the resistance value goes down on these probes instead of going up like they did on these plate temperature monitors so if I start to warm this one you can see the value go down real quick pretty sensitive and if since the wires aren't hooked up on this one and they're not hooked in series if I if I warm this one nothing happens the value does not go down so kind of interesting that uh, I have no idea why they just pick three random spots in the pack to uh, to monitor the temperature individually all right here's the balance of that harness for that three probe system and here's the connector where it connects into the BMS I've removed, obviously removed the BMS off the pack and it connects right here. So obviously the, the BMS is looking at temperature and that uh, in the, from those three probes in a random area of the, of the pack itself. 
these three connectors here, the, this gray one, the white one, and the black one, is what I'm interested in next. And they're all wired up with purple and black wires. And it's the individual monitoring of the voltage of the modules, the, the 48 modules, um, not the individual cells, because I don't, I don't think it has the ability to do that. The, there's four cells in each module. But I think it's looking at the voltage on all 48 modules and, and trying to regulate the voltage, the input voltage to charge them based upon what their current voltage is. Uh, these two plugs are just, I think they're integration plugs. Uh, this one doesn't connect, but it, it well, here it is here. Um, they connect the car, they integrate the car to the, to the battery pack. It's the BMS talking to uh, the car computer to tell, you know, how much voltage is there, how, how much range, um, you know, whether there's a problem in the BMS, all kinds of functions. I'm sure that these wires transmit to the uh, onboard computer because this um, harness takes these connectors or the wiring from these connectors to the front of the pack where it uh, connects from the battery pack to the car itself. can kind of see the uh, the business end of these battery or these modules and the way that the uh, BMS is looking at each individual module and I, I think I remember from uh, from other people on YouTube talking about these individual cells or the, the the way the cells are wired I believe the BMS can kind of break this module in, in twos there's four cells in each module but the way it's internally wired and the way they have um, these purple and black wires arranged on the top here, they can monitor, you know, half the cell at a time. They don't break it down into individual cells. But if I put my, uh, my fluke meter on here and, uh, and go from, from positive to negative here, I can read... Oh, I think, let me check it. I think it's uh, seven, 7.8 volts. But if I just check from here to here, it's 3.9 volts. And the same from here to here, it's 3.9 volts. So the BMS, I believe, is looking at two cells combined. And if it, if it notices an irregularity in the voltage between those two cells, you know, I, I'm not sure how sophisticated it is. Can it tell how much voltage is in there? And it, can it stop the charging? You know, is the, is the charging current coming through these wires as well? So it's charging two cells at a time in each module. I don't know. There's probably smarter people out there that know the answers to that. And I'd certainly like to, to see it in the comments down below. I'm not sure we're going to be able to get that sophisticated with our charging system. I'm not sure they are either, but at least I think we can be pretty well assured that the BMS, the battery monitoring system, is looking at two cells wired in series together to give us a 3.9 volts. Kind of interesting. And this is half the pack. This is that back row of modules that was in the, in the case all linked together. And I was able to pull those out as one unit and I can measure the voltage across the, the sum of this, this pack here. And uh, I don't, didn't write it down, but it's 186 volts, I think, which gives me a quick reference to know that every one of these cells in this module here is above 7.5. It's above the nominal voltage for each module. So... Um, not really knowing what condition this, this pack was, you know, as I bought it, 
used, it's already a good indication that these cells are in pretty good shape. They're all above the nominal voltage. Um, I'm going to break it down a little bit farther and uh, we'll look at each cell individually. Well, it took all the hardware out of it, all the bolts that held it to the top of the battery. And just a, you know, I don't need to teach you guys safety, but um, I just use a practice that we normally use with aircraft or with cars disconnecting batteries. If you take the negative side loose first, then if you short across with your wrench to to a ground it's negative to negative and you're not going to get any arcing and once you start to take these negative posts loose they're going to be you know every other one cattywampus here then you start kind of disarming this this cell you start reducing the voltage on it so the more you get disconnected the better off you are and i verified that but once once i got all the negative bolts out I put my fluke meter across this terminal to the positive terminal on the other end and it was reading zero voltage. So just pulling the negative bolts out does disconnect and it's obvious um, when you start looking at these plates, how they're designed. As soon as you pull the bolt out, you've disconnected. There's no connection there anymore. So that's the way I did it. And I plan on pulling all these copper plates out of this plastic because I'll probably reuse them hopefully um, when we reconfigure this thing we'll be able to reconnect the batteries in series using these copper plates now we'll probably get into a situation where we have to make some more or you know use a different type um, but for the most of the connections I think we'll be able to reuse these as well as as the hardware um, whoops the hardware to connect them all right folks uh, pretty productive day today got the battery disassembled uh, this is what's left of uh, well the stuff I'm probably not going to use uh, the metal will probably go back to the recycling center or go to the recycling center and the plastic I got a buddy of mine that's trying to melt it down and make diesel fuel out of it so we'll uh, see if he wants to to have a go at the plastic the rest of it over here uh, there was quite a bit of useful stuff in that uh, battery pack. Uh, obviously the batteries and I think a lot of this copper strapping I'm going to be able to reuse. Of course the hardware that holds the copper strapping on as well as the uh, the center pins or the center screws, um, whatever type of BMS that we use, maybe we can utilize those. There's a couple of pretty nice relays here. They're normally open relays, uh, look like they're fairly substantial. I've checked them, um, high current relays, uh, probably gonna be useful somewhere in the car. There's also a, a low voltage relay here that'll, uh, that may come in useful as well. A ballast resistor, uh, I'm not sure if that'll be useful, um, but uh, hey, Everybody needs a ballast resistor on hand, right? A large fuse and uh, of course the BMS and uh, whatever that other dealy was that uh, that used the, uh, the temperature sensors. Um, I, that's the relay assembly that interrupts the charging circuit for the temperature sensors. I believe that's what it is. The, the BMS I might throw on eBay to see uh, if there's any value in that. It won't be any good to me. Um, but there may be somebody out there with a uh, Nissan Leaf that needs another BMS, and I'm sure sure that one's still good. Um, interesting that the batteries, I've checked them with my fluke meter, and they're all running above nominal voltage, nominal voltage at 7.5 volts. They're all running 775. Uh, you can see this one right here i've got a little uh lcd screen or a, a screen i bought these off of ebay i got uh 50 of them well i ordered 50 i only got 48 and a little problem in the shipping but i was thinking about installing these on the batteries to kind of individually monitor the voltage of each individual battery i'm not sure if that's a good idea or not but i've got one uh, installed just temporarily to show you and uh, it's showing 7.71 uh, volts. When I check it with my fluke meter, it shows 7.75 volts. So not 
100% accurate. I mean, I believe the fluke meter, a little L LCD screen, um, hmm, you know, what do you expect? I don't know. Uh, probably not 100%, but close enough. 771's a good voltage, but I'm real comfortable with these cells. They're all running above nominal voltage by uh, by quite a bit. Uh, 775, 776, uh, 777, they're all right in there. What I'll probably do is go uh, check each one again, and then as I check them, I'll put a piece of tape on them with the, with the voltage, and then periodically check them um, as our progress goes on uh, with the car. Uh, just be able to double check to make sure that they're holding voltage uh, properly. All right, so what's next? Uh, I'm going to wrap this video up. And uh, the next deal is we I got to do some math. Uh, I, I think I've screwed up a little bit here. And uh, we'll get into that in the next video. Um, but we've got to decide how we're going to group these batteries together. And what voltage are we picking and where we're going to distribute them um, or how we're going to distribute the weight in the car and uh, that's all kind of crucial um, like i said I, I think i made a little bit of a boo-boo and uh, i'm not sure how i'm going to uh, whether i'm just going to live with it or whether i'm going to try to uh to back up and punt and uh and try to uh to make some changes but we'll get into that in the next video, a little teaser there, um, and we'll, we'll sort through it together. And uh, that way, uh, hopefully, it'll save somebody from making the same mistake. But, hey, appreciate you guys watching. appreciate all the support out there. And uh, once you get out in your shop, get something done.